G'day, how you going? My name's Boyd. I thought it might be prudent to boyish chatlets, if you like. Giving a wrap up of a trip I've just done, moving my boat from the Whitsundays in Queensland, Australia, through to Phuket, Thailand. And it's been about a three month event. It's also been an exciting event, something new to me. I've sailed all over the Queensland coast. I've sailed Tahiti, Croatia, the Ionian, the Whitsundays little bit around here in Thailand, but I've not done a uh, passage like this before. So I've had a lot of people on Facebook following while I've been posting along the way. And I thought, let's just put this together in a video and give a bit of a rundown on what's been going on. I hope it's worth your while. Grab a coffee, grab a beer, grab whatever you want. And, um, Let's have a bit of a yak about the trip that we've done. My old girl's been sitting on the hard stand in the Whitsundays for over 15 months. I came to Thailand for about a year and I thought while I'm doing that, I'll put it on the hard stand where it's safe and sound. I'll put it on the market, try and sell it, maybe buy another boat here in, in Thailand. As it turned out, when I crunched the numbers and when I realized I actually missed the boat, I decided, screw this, I'm going to keep the boat bring it here to Thailand, do a refit, and I'll be a happy guy. In the lead up to leaving the Whitsundays, had a bit of work to do on the hull, and that's what we have to do here in Phuket over the next couple of months, is haul the old girl out, cut a couple of sections of the hull out, replace them, and he fell. I'm gonna sandblast as well. Pretty much made as comprehensive a list as we could of jobs that needed to be done to do the best we possibly could to ensure the old girl was going to get uh, get the 4,000 plus nautical miles through to Phuket without a great deal of trouble. We've had our fair share of hiccups and glitches along the way, but we'll talk about those as we go. Once we got the some patches put on, once we got some cap shrouds replaced, I'm going to replace all of the rigging here in Thailand. And there is one other part of the standing rigging that I should have replaced. Yeah, because that came undone on the way, but we'll talk about that as we get through as well. So we've had the engine checked over, we've done oil changes, uh, fuel filters, uh, water collection uh, clean out in the fuel lines. We've done everything that we possibly could to ensure that safe uh, transition. I've installed also an AIS system, which is a mandatory requirement when you come through a lot of places in Southeast Asia. And I've got to say that since I've had the AIS, it's been an absolute godsend. I've tried to keep all the electronic shit on this boat to a bare minimum on the premise that the more crap you got, the more chances something's going to fucking break. We don't have a radar. Yeah, we've got VHS. We've got our Navi awnings. So I've got a Raymarine plotter and sounders and logs and all that crap. Don't have iridiums and all that gear. I thought where we're going, we'll be able to get eSIMs on the phone to get communication. There's parts where we're not going to get anything, but hey, we're still a shitload better off than we were cruising around 20 years ago. We got the work done in the Whitsundays. We splashed the old girl and thought, let's just do a week of 10 days bumming around the Whitsundays and see if we can break shit. And we did exactly that. Got about four or five days on the water bumming around the Whitsundays and then uh, 30 to 35 knot bloody sow easterlies rolled in and we pretty much got locked away in Hamilton Island for about a week, which you know, that was the way the cookie crumbles. And when I talk about we, I talk about myself. And at that point, two young people, a guy and a girl who joined to do the trip from the Whitsundays through to Thailand. Now, for whatever reason, uh, we were stuck down in Hamilton Island. Something went wrong. They decided to get off the boat. Well, well, shit happens, right? So I put another ad on Facebook and got another guy, Jason, who is a sailor, lives in Cooktown. He jumped on a plane, came down and... We left Early Beach, I think it was the 1st of May. Clear skies, general breezes, nice conditions to leave the Whitsundays as opposed to leaving in a howling gale or shit weather. So we trucked on from Early with a view to going straight through to Townsville. And, and that trip was a pretty harrowing one for me on the basis that the boat had not been in the water for 15 months. I hadn't done any significant cruising on it for probably a year and a half so i'm on high alert for anything that might burp or break or fart or anything so it was a 
it was a bit of a tense lead going up through Townsville, making sure that you know that, that the autopilot was working and making sure that the hydraulic systems and the and the running rigging, everything. It was just it, it was a bit of a tense moment. As we got closer to Townsville, of course, I was able to relax a lot more and enjoy the ride. So we spent a night or two in Townsville, uneventful thus far. From Townsville, we were originally aiming for Cairns, but Jason, the crew I had on board, great guy, knew what he was doing, great to have on board. He lived in Cooktown and we talked about it and decided, screw it, let's just go from Townsville straight through to Cooktown. On the way from Townsville through to Cooktown, I was having some uncertainties with the autopilot. I've got an old Course Master 800. Now, when I say old, I mean old. The bloody thing's probably 30 or 40 years old. We were having some troubles. We were running downwind with the uh, with the main and the head saw, and the autopilot was making some unfamiliar noises. Got on the phone to the tech. It was fundamentally as a result of the configuration of the sails. That is, the main was trying to, to round us up into the wind at the same time as the head saw was trying to pull us down. It was basically my error. Bottom line, no problems with the autopilot. So we spent a couple of nights at Fitzroy Island, and that was really nice, just chilling there and uh, doing a couple of more odd jobs and just and just preparing things, just being ready for stuff, you know. After Fitzroy, headed off to Cooktown. The trip to Cooktown was, again, pretty uneventful. That was a, We did an overnighter running up there. We did have a bit of an interesting uh, experience late one night as we uh, were between Cairns and Cooktown. I saw a red light, which I mistook for a port light on a, on a vessel, but then it went up to the height of the mountains, of which we could see the silhouette of, and I thought, okay, now that's not a big boat. And then it started coming towards us, then we saw other lights. As it turns out, we've had some helicopter come about 20 miles out to sea flew over the top of us, I put our deck lights on so they could see and then they just turned and disappeared. That was all a bit weird, all good. Uh, we arrived in Cooktown early in the morning and uh, went in and found a nice anchorage in there. By this stage it was blowing 20 to 25 and the forecast was for the winds to increase. Jason was kind enough to share with me some local knowledge. He's been living up there for 17 or 18 years or something. His advice was, well, this is what it's like for seven months of the year, blowing 20 plus from the southeast. And it, this is the way it is all the way up the Queensland coast. So great, I thought. There goes my uh, gentleman's cruising in, in 10 to 15 or 15 to 20. We were looking down the throat of 20 plus, 25, uh, all the way up the Queensland coast. As it turns out, it was blowing 25, 30. We spent four or five days hanging in Cooktown Jason went and hung out with his family. I went up for dinner one night, had a great time, and everything was fine. And then the day before we left, we heard on the radio a, uh, a vessel, the name I can't remember, uh, asking what the access to Cooktown was like. As it turns out, they had come south from Thursday Island in the worst of the blow that we'd experienced up there, which we would estimate it's probably 25 plus. We went and saw them when they got in, and these guys were on this beautiful big 50, 55 foot twin helm production boat, lovely looking boat. They'd taken 10 days to get from Thursday Island to Cooktown, and the guy mentioned some stages they were doing at best 1.2 to 1.5 knots. They were down to their last cup of fuel as they made their way into Cooktown, so it just goes to show that you've really got to pick your times when you're moving up and down the Queensland coast. Anyway, moving right along. So day came to, to head out of Cooktown. It was blowing a bit. I was a bit uneasy about how the old girl's going. I've been worried about the, the standing rigging, of course. The boat's pretty old. I've had it for eight and a half years. I've really only replaced the... I've replaced all the chain plates and reinforced those. I've also, just before we went back in the water in March, April, replaced the cap shrouds. We shot off, I think, in a 20-knot sou-easterly and as it turns out, we ran the entire way from Cooktown to Thursday Island in a few days, nothing other than the head saw. Full head saw out. Sometimes we had it maybe furled in halfway, but we were doing easy doing six knots, occasionally up to seven eights and even nine knots, which is pretty scary for a 40-something-year-old 17-ton 
aging steel catch. We, we all settled in, that is myself and Jason and the boat. We settled into this rhythm and routine, doing three hours on, three hours off through the night. We went hauling ass up the, uh, up the Queensland coast and it was reasonably uneventful. We had a bit of a lay day as we went past Princess Charlotte Bay. It went from 20 to 25 knots down to about three knots. So as we went through Princess Charlotte Bay, fired the engine up, read some books, chilled, relaxed, slept. And then later that afternoon, we got out of Princess Charlotte Bay and off we went again. So we scooched up to Thursday Island. 6.45 a.m. arriving Thursday Island, far north Queensland. Found an anchorage in Horn Island, which is just opposite uh, Thursday. Uh, really nice spot up there. You get a real sense of being remote. As we went into the Thursday Island and Horn Island area, of course, the we were doing this in the wee hours of the morning, just at first light, I guess, as we uh, as we rounded Cape York. Friggin' current, man. We were, we went from doing nine knots downwind to about two to three knots. There, the wind eased off a bit, but the current was just hauling through there. People had mentioned it was a pretty pretty strong current around that area, but uh, yeah, we experienced it. Things settled down a bit, and we made our way into Horn Island. So in Horn Island, the plan was we we're going to reprovision, get some food, get some diesel do what we need to do, spend a couple of days there, and then start making our plans to cross the Gulf on our way to Darwin. When we got into Horn Island, I'd noticed that my left eye was a bit dodgy, and it was a bit blurry, and I'm, I've just put it down to too much staring at a friggin' iPad all through the night as we wove our way up inside the Great Barrier Reef up the Queensland coast. We were bumming around on Thursday on. I thought, I'm just going to poke my head into the hospital and just get them to have a look at my eye and just tell me, is it just stress and strain or... Anyway, I got in there and after about five or ten minutes, they said, Mr. Jackson, you'll be on an aeroplane tomorrow morning to Brisbane for an emergency surgery on a detached retina. If we don't get you down there quickly, you may well lose your sight completely in your left eye. What the fuck just happened? That was a bit, <laughs> a bit of a shock the membrane on the back of my eyeball sort of flapped down like a bit of failed wallpaper. Next thing I have to tell Jason what's going on, make plans to secure the boat somewhere because neither of us are going to be on it. Jason decided to go back to Cooktown and as it turns out I was away for about two and a half weeks having an operation where they punch four friggin' holes in your eyeball, put the membrane back on the back of my eyeball, laser it all in place and a little stitch in these four places and they put gel or an oil type substance inside the eye to keep the membrane or the retina on the back of the eyeball. And now consequently, you may see that my left eye is a bit dodged. The reality is, is that this damn eye, if I cover my, my good eye, which is still fucked and needs glasses, this eye looks like what you see when you go underwater and you open your, everything is as blurry as buggery. Got to spend a few weeks with my son and grandson in Brisbane, flew back to, Thursday Island, did our restocking of fuel and water and all those types of things. Finally on our way from Thursday Island off to Darwin now after three weeks dicking around here with uh, detached retina and dodgy medical needs and all that bullshit. It's time to go. Six days from now we're hoping to be pulling into Darwin. In the months leading up to doing this trip and I've been getting my head around it for friggin' months. I've been reading on social media and all these different websites about all these different places that can be really suspect. Gulf of Carpentaria was one. We luckily crossed the Gulf of Carpentaria. Reasonably sedate conditions. I think we had maybe 15 knots from the southeast. Yeah, it was a bit sloppy, short and choppy and not that pretty, but reasonably uneventful. Now, thankfully, when we were in Cooktown, Jason, having lived there for 17 or 18 years, he knew a lot of people. And we met up with a guy there, a friend of his, who's done the run from Cooktown, say, to Southeast Asia 15 or 20 times. He gave us a couple of tips on making our way across the Gulf. And probably one of the best bits of advice he gave us was to stop at a place called Akaro Bay, which is about 90 nautical miles northeast of Darwin. And he said, you want to stop there the night before do not leave Akaro Bay until you are 10 hours prior to the high tide in Darwin. Because again, the currents can go roaring through that passage there just outside of Darwin. And we did, as suggested, the first two or three hours, 
we were punching along at three knots at best. And then everything changed and we pretty much shot our way through to Darwin. That's Darwin, baby. Once we got to Darwin, again, restocking, getting fuel, water, supplies, was looking for oil, for engine oil changes. I'd bought everything that I could get. But as it turns out, I get to Darwin and they say, yeah, mate, we're going to have a pallet or two of that, but it uh, should be here on Monday. But then they said that last Monday. So who cares about time? Anyway, as it turns out, we had enough oil, decided to keep going. Uh, Jason spent some time getting uh, some advice from the local fishing guys because we'd been trolling two lines from Early Beach all the way through to Darwin. And I don't want to disrespect Jason. And we nearly had a fish. He kind of hooked onto four fish. The only one we could get on the deck was a shark about, a, I don't know, 700 mils long. The other beautiful fish didn't quite see them. I believe they were there. But uh, anyway, we did have, however, flying fish jumping on the boat, other types of fish jumping on the boat. We had squid jumping on the boat. We got more self-sacrificing fish and marine life than we could get on two lines trolling. But anyway, we had fun. It was a good trip. Big night out at the cinema in Darwin, here at the Deck Chair Cinema. How cool. Outdoors, Guardians of the Galaxy 3 tonight. From Darwin, one of the really interesting things is, for, like for me, is that I've, I've traveled a fair bit overseas, yeah, go through the airport, like everyone's flashing passports and that sort of stuff, but I've never actually checked out of a country or checked in. So I reached out and contacted the Australian Border Force guys. They just requested a pile of information, ship registration, export documents, copies of passports and all these types of things. They were saying it was normally going to be like a four or five day lead time and we're thinking, well, we want to get going in a day or two because we've lost three weeks in Thursday Island while I had my friggin' eyeball repaired. As it turns out, the, the guys were just so good. When I explained to them what had happened, they said, look, okay, let me see what we can do. This was on a, like a Friday afternoon. And I think it was the Monday that organised to meet us at the fuel dock. Four dudes come down, or three dudes and a lady came down. In 20 minutes after they'd poked around all over the boat, they handed us our, uh, our clearance docks and we're on our way. It was just such a painless experience. And the guys were just absolutely magnificent. We set off from Darwin heading for Kupang in eastern Indonesia. Time to move on to Indonesia and here goes Darwin in the background. It's been fun, but keen to move. But we were hoping for a bit of wind and, and favourable and kind seas. As it <laughs> turns out, we hardly got a fucking breath of wind from Darwin all the way through to Kupang. It was like driving the boat through a friggin' swimming pool. And the sun goes down on another magnificent day aboard Morningside on our way from the Whit Sundays in Queensland, Australia to Phuket, Thailand. It's now 5.30 in the afternoon at about 9.30, 10 o'clock this morning. We were checked out through Immigration and Customs out of Darwin. Sadly, we are motor sailing because there's barely five to ten knots of wind. Like we were making good speed, about you know six, six and a half knots, I guess, under motor. Got into the rhythm of things, it was quite okay. But you know, we're a sailing boat, and the preference is to sail from the Whit Sundays to Darwin. We hadn't really used the motor much. We went hauling ass all the way up the Queensland coast. We probably 50% of the time we were motoring across uh, across the Gulf and across the top after the Gulf through to Darwin. But that's just because there was some shitty seas that we just wanted to just push our way through. Or come. We're trucking across the Timor Sea from Darwin to Kupang. We had a visit from a number of different uh, pods of dolphins, but one quite spectacular like I've never seen before. Another awesome experience with the dolphins on the way to Kupang from Darwin. These guys are having a ball. 30, 40, oh. even up to 50 dolphins, big dark grey fellas. They came and spent probably, I want to say, an hour, an hour and a half just messing about at the bow of the boat. It was just, it was wonderful. I sat up there with it for quite a while and you would see new ones would come in and then some would peel away and it, it just, it, it was it was really cool. It made a, uh, an otherwise rather boring motoring passage from Darwin to Kupang a lot more enjoyable. I don't know if you can see them there behind me still, but it seems the dolphins are back. 
We've already had the best part of an hour with them and they've kind of thinned out a bit. And I'll notice that there's a few more of them back again. So it must be party time at the bow of Morningside for the dolphins. They are just the coolest creatures. Love sitting up here on the bow with them. As the sun's going down, it's a beautiful day, beautiful company. Anywho, another great day. Stay tuned, let's see what happens tomorrow. Uh, the other thing, I was sitting here in the cockpit one afternoon reading as we're just motoring away, and I heard this god awful engine noise. And my first thought was, oh crap, it just sounds like the engine is just flying to bits. After about five seconds, hang on, this is not, this is not right. And I looked out off the port side and not probably about the height of the mast, there was a twin engine aircraft with border force written on the side of it. And they must have, well, I want to say they were maybe a hundred meters off our, our port beam at around about the height of the mast. And I thought, oh, there's another highlight for the day. A couple of minutes later, they got on the radio and had a bit of a chat, really nice guys. They just basically got in touch, Morningside Border Force. Just checking everything okay down there? Yeah, no, we're fine. Everything's great. Oh, if you've got any problems, let us know. We're uh, always monitoring 1-6. So that was really comforting to know that the Australian Border Force are out there not just looking for bad shit, but they're there to help and they're just they're decent blokes. The one comment that he made was, uh, T, you picked your timing. This is probably the calmest conditions we've seen in a couple of years. So there you go. One of the other things... As we're crossing Darwin to Kupang, Indonesia, in the eastern side of Indonesia, and my thoughts were often going to what to expect in relation to FADS, the fish attracting or fish aggregating device, fishing boats with no lights, and all these horrible things, charts that are inaccurate, how I needed to have open CPN with satellite pictures, and all the, all the bullshit. It all became a bit too much. I just thought I want to keep it simple and I want to keep it safe. I don't want to find myself sitting in front of a freaking computer trying to learn all these new platforms, forget doing what I'm here to do most importantly, which is drive the friggin' boat. As we approached Kupang, Indonesia, we started to talk about, this is Jason, the crew, and I started to talk about, okay, we've got to get ready for fads. We don't really know what we're going to be looking for. We don't really know what we're going to be seeing. Jason had done some work previously in a job of his with the Marine Services and had some experience with FADs in various locations, but they were usually high-tech with lights and all that sort of stuff. And we're hearing in Indonesia and through Malaysia and Thailand that, that potentially the FADs are just hunks of timber and stuff that have been anchored in weird and remote places. So we weren't quite sure what to expect. And the same goes with the fishing boats. They're saying that they're the... There's boats with no lights. We were lucky enough to plan it to arrive there in daylight. We, we sighted land first, I don't know, maybe half an hour after first light. So the timing was pretty good. We had seen some fishing boats out off eastern Indonesia. They didn't pose any problems because they were just lights all over the place. We rocked into Kupang, dropped the anchor, went ashore. I decided that I wanted to use agents for our check-ins and check-outs because it was just an unfamiliar territory to me in an unfamiliar country. And I thought, you know what, for the sake of the 50, 80 or 100 bucks or whatever it was, and that's about all it was, it made life a lot easier because we're dealing with locals who know where the grocery stores are, who know where we can get oil and fuel and water and immigration and customs and the harbour master and all that bullshit. And I'm glad that we did in Kupang. We had to go, we went to customs, then we went to immigration, we had to go back to customs, and it's 22 kilometres between those two offices. It paid off to have all of our ducks in a row. We had copies of everything. I've got my little fancy rubber stamp with Morningside and the boat registration, the, the AMSA registration, all those types of things. And I quite enjoyed Kupang. It was a buzz little place every night, just near where we anchored. There's a little plaza type area and all the families are coming out doing the sunset things and there's music rocking and all these remote cars, the kids are buzzing around. It was, it was, it was an enjoyable energy there. And uh, after a couple of days, we, uh, we decided to move on from Kupang directly through to Lombok. Now, just a side note here is that this trip wasn't necessarily a six month holiday for me. It was more a delivery of a boat than it was a holiday trip. Wanted to enjoy it along the way, but the, the job was, let's just get there in a safe and respectable time 
and I'll talk to you a bit more about some of the stats and numbers towards the end. So we left Kupang, headed for Lombok. Again, the forecasts were were not too bad. We'd also got a eSIM through a company called Airalo, A-I-R-A-L-O, I think it was. I had an eSIM that, uh, that I purchased for my phone so I could get local internet and data. That worked really well for getting weather reports and, and checking out uh, weather radars and windy and predict wind and all these types of things to, to get updates. So that's really worthwhile. Don't have sat phones, iridiums and Starlinks and all the other crap. Just keep it simple. We trucked off from Kupang to Lom, directly to Lombok. I think we left there with, with light winds, hoping for enough to give us a push. First 24 hours or so was pretty much just motoring again. We've been, uh, we've been motoring all day today. Not a breath of wind forecast for the next week. At best, we've had two or three knots today. Beautiful day though. We're bobbing on at about six knots, six and a half knots. Got to be happy with that. Last out, Indo style. We're coming up here on one of the much talked about FADs, the fish attracting devices here in uh, in Indonesia between Kupang on our way to Lombok. As you can see, it's not a very fancy looking device. There's no lights on it. It just looks like a hunk of bamboo strung together with string creating a, uh, I guess a false environment or a uh, man-made environment for fish to hang around. We started to get a bit of wind coming up, so up go the sails and the heady goes out and we're looking, oh, this is great. And then that wind turned into a bit of a grey cloud and a bit of a grey mess ahead of us. The main was down. It almost seemed like in an instant, probably 15 to 20 minutes, we've gone from pretty much sunny, sunny skies overhead to gusts of wind 25 to 30 knots flattened the sea of course just whipped the whipped the tops off the sea we'd had the head so, head sail out thought oh let's just see how this goes the 20 to 25 knots even 30 knots it lasted for a couple of moments then it seemed to settle a bit and i thought let's just see how we go then i heard this pop sound up from f up forward and i thought oh, i don't know what that is could be something just falling or what the kayaks settling it bugged the shit out of me for about 10 to 15 minutes and i went up there and i looked and i noticed that my forestay had a really big bow in it and i thought this is this is not right have i lost a, a whisper stay one of the stays off either side port and starboard side of the bowsprit had i lost a bob stay the, the stay that goes from the front of the bowsprit down to the water line on the bow of the boat they all were intact and i happened to look up and i noticed mm, the, the core of the foil of my head saw furler had detached, meaning my forestay that runs through the center of the, of the furler, my forestay had gone, it had snapped, and it was all just hanging up there on my halyard, that is the halyard that, that hauls the, the head saw up the, up the furler. So I ran back here and I thought, okay, let's see what happens here. I've got, to, I've got to get that sail in. So I thought, well, is it going to furl okay? I thought I've just got to give it my best shot. It furled up okay. The concern, if that halyard popped, the whole four stay with, with the furled head saw is going to come down and we're going to have a shit storm here. And I'm starting to think, okay, if it does that, what are we going to do? How are we going to secure it? We eventually ran a halyard, got a Dyneema halyard spare that runs down from the top of the crown of, the, of my main mast. And we managed to get a couple of half hitches, brought the halyard down, got a couple of half hitches around the whole of the forestay and the head saw arrangement. And with the mooring pole, managed to poke those half hitches up the sail as high as we could and secured it a couple of times down and then just winced that halyard in to take some of the load of the head saw and the furler and the broken stay so that we could make our way to the next port which was Lombok without that shitstorm hitting the deck and doing god knows what damage. The interesting thing though going through the Lombok Strait we rounded the point into the Lombok Strait we'd noticed way out in the distance towards Bali there was a surf sizable whitewash from what looked like a surf we checked on the charts no reefs and stuff Later learnt that that's just a normal Lombok straight thing with the excessive currents that are running south 
with the uh, with the tide, it just sits up and gets ugly. And not long after that, just as we rounded the the point, we'd been doing maybe six six and a half knots. We started, we noticed we're doing seven knots. Oh my God! We're now we're doing eight. We're actually in the Lombok Strait, hugging the shore, and the reef. I want to say I could see was maybe 100 metres away. I wanted to stay there close to it to be out of the as best I could to be out of the, the main thrust of it. But we got up, I think, to 9.8 knots at one point. So we were in a backwash. We got one and a half to three quarters of the way through, passed a small headland, went from our eight, nine, nine and a half knots down to 3.2 knots. We got into Lombok and this is where we started to find all rows and rows of buoys that we had to navigate our way through. We eventually dropped the pick at, at Marina del Rey and just loved being there. It was a great little spot, nice little haven tucked away there, small marina, which is which is basically a floating pontoon, at the end of which is a small resort with five or 10 cabins and a bar and a restaurant and awesome food and really friendly and helpful people. And that's where we dropped the pick and decided we need to deal with this four stay. As it turns out, not possible to get a four stay in Indonesia that was going to do the job for us. As it turns out, I ended up going to Rolly Tasker. Uh, Rolly Tasker sales in uh, in here in Phuket, they were just absolutely brilliant. To cut a long story short, there was a lot of bullshit getting the gear organised to be imported and, and in through customs into Indonesia. I had people in Indonesia tell me, oh, it's not going to happen, you won't be able to import it, you'll pay ridiculous prices, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Anyway, contacted uh, Rolly Tasker on a Friday. I had the new force day in my hand Sunday of the following week. That's, what's that, like eight or nine days later. We opted for a, a swage on the top of the stay and for a stay lock fitting on on the base of the four stay so that I could fit it myself and get the dimensions exactly right. Four stay's still there but it's all just hanging or it was hanging just on the halyard and there's Jason up there checking out what's going on. So this is what they mean when they say sailing is about fixing boats in exotic places. Here we are doing repairs to the four-stay in beautiful Marina del Rey in Lombok, Indonesia. What a magic day, magic location to fix a boat. Faithful assistant number one. It all went up and we've had no problems with it, touch wood. I'm opting when I do replace all my standing rigging on the boat here in Phuket, I'm going to go for stay locks top and bottom on everything and carry spare stays with me. The stay locks, that was an eye opener for me. And Rolly Tasker, awesome job. Can't recommend them enough. I've also got, ironically, a, um, a brand new Rolly Tasker main that I'd bought maybe six months before I took the boat out of the water. That main, I just absolutely love it. It's a slightly heavier grade sail that, than would normally be on a boat, but given that we're cruising and, and she's a big lump of a thing, we opted to, to just go for that slightly heavier, heavier duty thing. We had a local driver there, nice young bloke, really helpful and knows everything. He took us out one day for a day trip. We contacted him and said, take us somewhere that's interesting. Don't want to go necessarily to the tourist spots, but just take us somewhere where, where we can have a good day and get off this damn boat and see some fun stuff. So he took us to, to waterfalls on Lombok, which was brilliant. I had a fall and hack my bloody shin open because of now, remember, I've got a dodgy eye and I've got 40% vision out of my left eye, so depth perception is really fucked and I've come a buster in a, one of these tracks and hacked my leg open. But anyway, it uh, shit happened. So we had a great time up there. Then from there, he said, oh, look, we've also got a traditional stick fighting festival happening today. He's taken us from the waterfalls to a uh, traditional hand weaving village and where they're hand weaving all sorts of things. From there, we were heading to the traditional stick fighting, which was an absolute riot. We're going to a tr traditional stick fighting competition. Okay. 
and on the way to the stick fighting, we went past a marriage um, or a wedding procession ceremony thing with an array of people. and the most gargantuan, enormous sound system I've ever seen in my life. The damn thing was like two stories high on its own trailer with a, with a trailer guys on guitars behind it. Was, and that was quite impressive. That was an awesome day. We had a great day out that day. After this though, we started to realize we'd been there for a couple of weeks. Jason had a bit of a timeline. Uh, he was stuck in an awkward position and opted to jump on a plane and go back to Australia, which is which is fine. I understand that he had to do that. Sad that he couldn't complete the trip though. I finished, did the install with a couple of the local boys there on Lombok and decided I needed to find some. Decided I needed to find some additional crews. Ended up finding a young Aussie girl in Lombok on another boat. She jumped on and stood him up from here in Phuket. I spoke to her and said I'd love for her to come down because I missed her and I wanted to see her. So she's come down as well. I ended up leaving after being in Lombok two and a half weeks, leaving with Lorian and Sudima, we were basically aiming to knock over the last 1,500 nautical miles. We'd already done about 2,500 nautical miles to Lombok. We had 1,500 to go. And the plan was to truck up the northern side of the island, straight up Malacca Straits and into Thailand. The trip coming up from Lombok, it was reasonably uneventful. The seas were reasonably calm. We, we did come across a lot of fads and an array of fishing shit. In some instances, yes, there were lots of fishing boats and we would find ourselves maybe 100 miles off an island somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And all of a sudden you would come across 20 or 30 or 50 fishing boats in the middle of the night that you've got to navigate your way through, not knowing if they've got nets connecting to them, are they moving, are they anchored, or whatever. So you've got to be super diligent. As we're making our way from Lombok um, northwest, we opted to stop at an island called Barween. Beautiful little island, it's just a speck in the middle of, well, it's not in the middle of nowhere, but in the middle of, I think it's the Java Sea. We went in and found a beautiful little little anchorage in there. It's in Barween that, I, that I'd noticed that I wasn't burning engine oil, I was in fact producing it. The oil level was getting higher on my dipstick, which is a red alert really, because the only thing that can be in there is either water or diesel. As it turns out, it seems that we had diesel entering into the sump somewhere. I went through all the possible obvious things. My high pressure pump bleed screws, one of them, I turned it about a half to three quarters of a turn. So that's not a good sign. I went through and nipped up some of the fuel lines. They all were fine. But with my injectors, they're actually underneath the rocker covers in the top of the engine. And there's a small crossbar that goes across the top of the injectors and holds it firm inside the head, inside the block. I thought, well, I'm just going to start tightening things to see what happens. Two of those crossbars, I could probably get a half a turn on this, the nuts, but one of them got, I think, about one and a half turns, which is way too much. We decided to remove completely the lift pump with the thought in mind that the diaphragm inside the lift pump could in fact have failed. I cut a stainless plate and bolted it back onto where the lift pump mounts onto the side of the engine. Took the fuel line basically from the fuel filter straight into the hard line fuel intake into the engine. And so far so good, after 140 hours, it appears like the old girl's back to making good oil black 
and burning a little bit. We decided that once we got up into the Ryu group, R-I-A-U group of islands, southeast of Singapore, didn't want to go through there doing night runs, so we decided to go to the su- to a southernmost suitable anchorage. From Barween, we made our way to Belatung, and Belatung is where we decided to check out of Indonesia, because I didn't really want to go up towards Singapore and cross over to Nongsa, where most people would check out. And we thought, we'll do Belatung and then just keep trucking on. Another day comes to a close on the good ship morning side on our way from Barween to Belatung. This is a tough life. We've got another uh, maybe eight or ten hours to go before we get to our anchorage where we check out of Indonesia. Having a great time developing some new fashion sensors with my dickhead hat. In Belatung we, we fell in love with a little anchorage way up in the north, oh god what is it, the north western corner of Belatung beautiful little anchorage really picturesque and this is where of course my satellite views overlay in navionics paid off helped us to get a better understanding of what the hell's going on on around us and we got in there nice and close and had a had a great little anchorage and we spent a couple of days there doing the rounds doing our provisioning and doing our checkouts i would have liked to have stayed in bellatung a bit longer because it was just such a pretty place really enjoyed it it's from here that we were going to be doing a lot of our short legs from Belatung we shot the I think 120 nautical miles or so up to Bangka and then basically just do our best to day hop from there until we got close enough to Singapore and the Malacca Strait that we could do an early start and then just go straight past Singapore past Malaysia and straight into Thailand but there was one point there out in the middle of this one leg and this is a lesson to be learnt with Navionics I would plot our course on Navionics I initially start with okay I'm here I want to go to there I'll allow it to do its automatic route plan but I will always review it always review it and make any adjustments that I see fit in particular the most common one is it will have you running close to, to headlands and coasts. And I don't like doing that because distance is safety in a boat. You know, reasonably intense currents, you can get slop and chop sitting up. And if something's going to go wrong, that's where it's going to go wrong. So I always give the, the headlands a wide berth. But the other thing that I'll always do in particular in Southeast Asia, I want to zoom right in to about 0.2 of a mile on the small scale that's down in the bottom right-hand corner, 0.2 to 0.3 of a mile. And I want to go along that entire suggested track or the the adjusted track that I've put in to make sure that there's nothing there that's not visible on a on a view where you've zoomed out more, if that makes sense. Came across 50 or 60 boats. I was dodging through them and I crept off my track. I want to say maybe a mile or two left of this and I'll go to the left of that. Then I'll go to the right of that one before you know it. I'm way out here, a mile or two off my course and I'm looking through the boats, and yep, most of them are behind me. I can see one last boat that I need to go around up ahead, and as I got closer, I thought, that boat's not bobbing around like all the rest of them. We got maybe a half a mile to three quarters of a mile from this. I'd zoomed in on Navionics at this point and realised that there was a friggin' reef there that wasn't visible on a broader zoom. If we'd have been doing this shit at night, we probably would have been on that reef. There was no lights on it, no markers, no nothing. It had a, a, a reef that ran, oh, I don't want to say a long way, but maybe 500, 800 metres off, off the southern side of it. We were able to skirt around it, but it just reminded me how important it is to zoom in on your Navionics. And if you change your course, make the adjustment on Navionics to follow you. Instead of you following the track on Navionics, you bring the track to you and zoom in again and make sure that wherever you're going it's clear as clear as you can possibly see it to be so that was a bit of an eye out and that was a bit of a holy shit moment and we trucked on and and the the anchorages i've got to say up in the ryu group i think that's how you pronounce it r-i-a-u group of islands they're not that pretty you know the people are friendly we had a couple of canoes coming into uh fishing boats and canoes coming alongside to say good day and you know you've got cigarettes you've got beer one young guy came in and, you have cigarettes? Oh, no, mate, no, 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 no cigarettes, no cigarettes. And then he said, oh, you got books? Oh, no, 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 no. And, and I was just into the no, no, no thing because I don't want to be just giving out cigarettes and beer. After the dude left, I thought, books? Hang on a minute, the guy's asked for books. Surely I could have rustled up a few books. He was long gone by the time, but I kind of kicked myself. I thought, what a nice young bloke. Yeah, he wanted a cigarette and to read a book, you know. 
Good on him. The fishing devices, we'd seen a couple of fads outside of Coupang, and all they were were bamboo structures. As we made our way through Indonesia, we found that some of these fishing things would change in their nature. As we got up a little bit further into the islands, to, getting closer to Singapore and the Malacca Strait, we found these friggin' fishing platforms. They're structures that might be 15 metres square with a, with a deck area, let's call it, or a floor that might be three or four metres above the, above the water with a hut on top and you can see the nets draped underneath the, underneath the floor area. We're doing a day hop today from Kenta Island to Pillow Rufino, I think it's called. And we're just currently passing Samanka Island, the Royo Group, not far east of Singapore. We've got these fishing platforms. I've just done a quick count in what I can see. We've got 78 of them. It's sad reality, and I don't think these guys realise on the large scale that they're just raping the land, taking anything they possibly can, and not giving any of these species a chance to breed. These things could be an absolute friggin' nightmare trying to make your way through them in the middle of the night. Bad fishing boat or fishing pontoon. God only knows, that's a pretty mighty construction. Apparently that's what the, the uh, Indos use for uh, the squid with big nets underneath. They light the things up like Christmas trees and uh, track the squid and scrimp them up with nets underneath. Not quite sure what it is, but it's a beast of a boat. We did a short run, 40 miles, 45 miles, to another small anchorage called Palau Rano, R-A-N-O-H. When I was checking it out on Navionics, it looked like a reasonably tight little anchorage. It looked like it could possibly be exposed to a bit of the roll from the swell that was rolling up through the sea there. We got in there sort of late in the afternoon, wanted to try and tuck in close to, this, to the eastern side of that anchorage close to the point where there's a very cute little resort to try and get out of the swell and we kissed the bottom again. No major issue, we're steel, 17 tonnes of steel so it wasn't a hard hit, it was just like a glide over but we backed off from that, dropped the anchor, it was reasonably uncomfortable during the first part of the evening because of the way the current had us sitting in the wind and the, the, the little bit of roll that was there but by the time we woke up in the morning it was like a mill pond again, it was beautiful. And from Ranau, we went on to an island called Durian Basar, B-E-S-A-R. I really liked this. It was a nice big open place. It was peaceful and it was quiet and it was calm. And it was a really nice spot to just take a breath. And we got there at a respectable hour in the afternoon and able to rest, watch a movie, just, and chill. And for me to get my head into gear, for what was coming the next day, which was a three hour run up to, towards Singapore, where we would join the intersection of the shipping lane through the Malacca Strait. Now, again, like everyone, I'd heard all these shitstorm stories about Malacca Straits, the, you know, the busiest shipping lane in the planet with two or 300 boats, ships, not boats, ships and cargo ships a day. You've got the Sumatra storms that will come through and blow 50 knots and sweep all your rigging and your mast off the deck, including small children and dogs if they're not tied down. And so you go into these things with an element of anxiety, and that's not a bad thing. It's good to have a bit of fear and keeps you pretty much on your toes. After we did our night at Jury and Bissar, we off to an early start, first light. Okay, the plan was truck up towards Singapore, find a break in the, in the flow of ships, whatever that might be, cross the eastbound and westbound shipping lanes, and then join the northern fringe of the outbound shipping lane. And if you have a look on Navionics, you can see it. It's this weird misshapen pink bit that goes across the outbound shipping lane. And a few people suggested, and it made a lot of sense to me, if you stay on that line, you're going to, be, you're going to have a high likelihood of being free from all, any fishing boats and nets and all that bullshit. And if you stay on that line, you're not going to be a bother to the, to the ships. If you go in there with the attitude that I'm a sailing boat and I have right away, well, you're fucked. 
you've got to give respect to these guys because they can't manoeuvre them. It takes them, what, a kilometre or two to stop the damn things. We opted to stay in that pink line all the way up for, I don't know, 140, 150 miles, I think it was, before we exited and followed the Malay coast up towards Thailand. Now the fun part. We're about to join the eastbound shipping lane, but we have to cross it and get on the northern side to stay out of the way of these lumbering big things. And it does kind of feel a bit now like we're joining the herd of lumbering bloody elephants and they just keep coming. Apparently about 295 ships a day move through uh, the Malacca Straits here. So we're probably going to get to see quite a lot of those over the next couple of days. Exciting, huh? When we first started to cross the, the shipping lane, we could see these ships just moving, big monsters of things moving slowly. And I said, here's our go. So we started to truck across and there were two ships coming towards us. It was totally like crossing a busy highway of lumbering elephants in slow motion because like we're doing six and a half knots, right? We're currently crossing the famed shipping channel in the Malacca Strait. We've got ships heading to the east that way. And there's, I don't know if you can see them out there, there's more heading to the east. There's a big hoo over there. So we're trying to cut across the stern of these vessels in the eastbound lane so we can make our way to the westbound lane. And believe it or not, Singapore is dead ahead, probably five or six miles, but it's buried in a cloud of haze and smog. A bit exciting, but manageable. And you kind of want to go faster. But it was an, an uneventful cross. We managed to get across both lanes, turned to port, stuck on that pink line all the way up, and we did not have a problem with any of the ships, any of the fishing boats. We saw some fishing boats off our starboard in the, in what I think what they call a transit lane or something. Saw a couple of barges there as well, but nothing ever came close in that Malacca Strait, giving us any grief or causing us any, any trouble. Except, except we were introduced to a Sumatra. Now Sumatra people have talked about and they're wicked storms that, that roll off the, the island of Sumatra and roll into the Malacca Strait and can blow the hair off your head. We were trucking up there, we saw this thing coming, there was lightning everywhere. And we're like, all right, get ready for this. All the sails were in, everything was lashed down. Went and did a run around the deck to make sure there was no loose stuff. Told the, the girls on the boat, hey, this is, might be a little bit hairy, but you know, everything will be fine. The boat will handle it, well, I hope. The diligent crew on watch, laundry's hanging out. And the princess. Main thing I wanted to make sure that we just didn't get blown into a passing barge on one side or lose our way in front of a friggin' cargo ship in the other. This thing hit us, and I've got to tell you, one minute it's blowing, I don't know, 10 or 15 knots and everything's fine. The next, within seconds, it was gushed into like 30 to 30, or maybe more, I don't know. I don't even have a wind instrument on board other than a wind direction doodad on top of the mast. We were healing at 45 degrees. Now we're 17 tons and we had nothing up other than a mast and standing rigging. It just blew us over and spun us. God, it would have been about 45 to 50 degrees to starboard. The chop was short. It was about a metre and it was just, it was so disorienting. It's like, what the fuck just hit us? But the thing that we, that, that we noticed is, holy crap, that wind is cold. It was freezing. We managed to sort of stabilise ourselves and we're all running for sweaters and jumpers. It was that friggin' cold. I couldn't believe it. But that cold lasted for all of about six minutes and then it was gone. We managed to reorient ourselves because I did, I've got to be honest, I got a bit disoriented. I couldn't see shit anywhere. Lightning was going off all over the place. I regret, regathered my thoughts, got us back on our track. The autopilot coped with it fine and the worst of it passed in about 15 minutes. There was a ton of lightning though and that was the stuff that was freaking me out. And I'm saying to the guy, stay standing on the rubber mat, stay standing on the rubber mats. I've been on a boat struck by lightning once before in uh, the Ionian in Greece and that was scary shit. A marine electrician 
engineer dude who was rewiring that charter boat once we returned it. I was talking to him. I said, what's the worst that could have happened? He said, truth in it or not, I wouldn't have a clue. If someone had been standing on the wet deck, hanging onto the, uh, any of the rigging, there's every chance that all that would have been left of them was their jewellery. And I'm like, oh, that's not a pleasant thought. Anyway, 30, 40 minutes later, it passed. We got through it. We survived in Sumatra and everything was fine. After we left the shipping channel, I think the following day, we saw a couple of storms, made some alterations to our course just to, to stay clear of them. As I suggested earlier, once we'd changed our course to go around storms, depending on which way we could see that they were going, if they were heading from left to right, we would go around behind and so on and so forth. But once we'd made these course adjustments, I'm always now going back in to make the adjustments on Navionics to what our new heading is and doing that super zoom in to make sure that everything, everything is clear. The other thing that we noticed also once we got into the Malay waters and before we got into Thailand is that we could identify all the lights of the fishing boats on the AIS. And that was a really comforting thought. I'm not saying there, that, that it was 100% that every single one of them had AIS, but there were times there I'm looking thinking I can see eight boats and I can see eight fishing boats on AIS. And, and that was really comforting. We didn't see any fads or fishing stuff at all after I think Bangka, which is the last area in the Raiu group where we'd seen this 70 or 80 fishing platforms. So that was pretty comforting too. And so from there, we went up the Malay coast, past Langkawi. This was a three or four day run, I think, a total of 463 miles from Durian Basar to Kolipi. I was a bit knackered and the girls were too. It had been a a reasonably long haul and so we just dropped the pick in Kolipi, didn't get off the boat, had a swim, slept, watched a movie, got up the next morning and then went on to a beautiful little island in the southern end of Thailand called Koh Rok Nai. Until next time Kolipi. Again there, just we just wanted to stop, just wanted to do a couple of day hops and, and not push so hard, dropped the pick and just relaxed and had a swim and, and that was it. Lots of stuff in Thailand. Leap from Ko Rock Nai. The plan was to head back to Shillong in Phuket here, which is where I am right now. For the first time in, let's call it 4,000 nautical miles, we had a headwind. Everything else was behind us, everything. Well, of all of our sailing, probably 90% of it was just under headsail only. Every time I put the main out, it was just, it got in the way, it shadowed the headsail. And this last leg, I'm like thinking, oh, this is, this is fucking right. 15 knots on the nose, we were heading, uh, let's call it west northwest towards Shillong from where we were. That's where the wind was coming from, 10 to 15 knots, but I'm guessing it was more like 18 to 20. We were bloody tacking and bullshit, and I'm like, oh, I'm fucking over this. We were motor sailing at one point, because I'm now, as you can understand, I'm sure, just keen to get to the destination when we're that damn close. Cranked the motor up a little bit, pushed it a little bit too hard, and then brrr, the bloody temperature started to go up, and I'm like, no, this is bullshit. PP was right near us and I thought, you know what, we're going to go in, I need to check this engine, see what's going on, am I having oil issues, is it, oh, whatever the hell it is. So we went in and dropped the pick in PP, checked the engine and waited for the, for the weather to die. So after two nights at PP, we got back and did our last leg and arrived here the day before yesterday about midday. So there is the wrap on our 4,068 nautical mile passage from the Whitsundays in Queensland, Australia, up the inside of the Great Barrier Reef, across to Indonesia, through Indonesia, past Singapore, Malaysia, and southern Thailand into Phuket. I hope it hasn't been too boring. It's been a real experience for me, an enjoyable experience. And I've got to say, I am just blown away by this old boat. I've had it for eight and a half years. I'm not getting teary, it's okay. I've had it for eight and a half years, 
I'm not pedantic about everything that I do on it. I try and stay on top of the key priority things. You know, she's getting a bit rusty now. There's a few rust spots starting to appear, but the plan is the next month or two is to haul out here and sandblast and repaint. So I'm not overly fussed about some of the surface rust. My old Lister HRW3, aside from leaking a bit of diesel into the sump, it has not missed a beat. Just keeps thumping away. Oil pressure sometimes can be a little bit low. My temperature runs 80 to 82 degrees at 1600 RPM. And I think 48 hours, 54 hours straight, non-stop. I do tend to stop the engine every 24 hours. I just want to check the oil to make sure, one, there's no uh, diesel getting into the sump, and two, that I'm not burning oil due to some uh, unforeseen situation. Other than that, motor's been an absolute friggin' dream. Solar's been a dream. The only failure that we had was the, the four-stay, and for a 40-year-old boat to knock over 4,000 miles, and that's, that's the only thing we've got to worry about is, you know, got to be happy with that. So for those of you, of you that are interested, I've got some stats here. I'm not big on numbers, I'm not big on anal log books. I have a log book which I started doing when I left Early Beach for the simple reason, on that keep it simple, stupid basis, this old girl does not have an engine log. That is, it doesn't have a record of the hours the engines run. So I've got to keep that. And from the log yesterday, I've got here a spreadsheet that I've knocked up. Very impressive. Here's one we prepared earlier. Um, it just shows the dates that we departed all these different places, our departure point, our destination, our duration, that is the, the, how long that particular leg was, the distance and the average speed. And I'm just going to give you the wrap up because this is what I was interested in with a rusty old battleship like this old girl. The total distance travelled, unless I've missed something or cocked something up, which is quite possible. Total distance travelled from Early Beach and the Whit Sundays to Phuket Thailand was 4,065 nautical miles. The total hours that we travelled, 713.8 hours of travelling. But the days on the move is 29.7. I remember estimating and telling people before I left the Whit Sundays, it's like, I should be able to do this in 30 days if I went non-stop. That wasn't a bad, well, estimation. The average distance we travelled per day in that 29.7 days is 136.7 nautical miles, which is not too bad for an old tub. And the average speed overall over the entire trip was 5.4 knots. Again, I'm pretty happy with that. I think the highest speed that I, I remember seeing was 9.8 as we went building up the Queensland coast. Typically what will happen if, if, we've got, if we're doing three knots or so for any length of time, screw it we're putting them putting the engine on i'll lay these up if anybody's interested look the other thing to consider too is it, i know that there's quite likely that there's going to be some hardened and salty sea dogs that'll pick the eyes out of this video and some of the bullshit that i'm banging on about go your hardest if that's what you want to do i'm i'm more than happy to help anyone in any way that i possibly can and the most important thing that you always got to remember when you're doing any of this stuff is just be friggin safe and when all else fails drive the boat the most important thing for me is just being safe, having a great time, and doing it as efficiently as humanly possible. And we've managed to do that. Thank you so much for your time. It's been an awesome trip. I flew out of Thailand on March 23, until early August. It's all been about getting the boat from the Whitsunders in Australia to here, and we've done it. I've had several crew changes, all great people, great trip, great boat outperform my expectation. I'm looking forward to spending some time, one, doing some work on the boat and doing a, a bit of a cosmetic refit uh, inside and out. And I'm looking forward to getting the boat back in the water by November, December here in Thailand so I can get out and enjoy some of the most beautiful anchorages on the planet. Have a great day. Thanks for your time. Any questions, bump me a message. Happy to help if I can. Ciao now.